All right, so I gave you all this coffee mug start blend. Uh, so let's take a minute before we start worrying about textures and shading. Let's examine the scene. Um, in the scene, you look in the outliner. There are a total of five things in the scene. There's a camera, which is right here, um, right there. There's the a cube, which is actually on layer two, which we will get to momentarily. Uh, there's the ground plane. There's this uh, plane, which is actually set up with an emission material. So that is the light in the scene. And then there is the mug. Um, if I go over to my world settings, you can see that I actually gave the world an environment texture. Uh, and I did it the same way that I've done it a few times before, which is not that. But if you go to search.creativecommons.org uh, and search for equal rectangular um, and flicker is what I search with, you get all these dis different images. So I chose one, and the one that I chose actually is, looks like, uh, Textures Equa Bookstore. This is the image. For whatever reason, it's rotated in this view. Uh, it's a very large image, 5,000 by 10,000. Um, but I've got that set up, uh, which Blender are we in? Oh. No, that's a part one. There it is. Okay. So I have my background, and I've got my background nodes selected up here. I can choose between my uh, material nodes and my background no nodes. So I've got background texture. I have that texture selected as my environment texture, which is Shift A, add texture, environment texture. Uh, and then I have two nodes here, uh, texture coordinates in mapping. So if I go to my 3D view and hit 5 to go into perspective view, and then shift Z to go into shaded view, uh, and in my world settings turn camera visibility back on, you can see the image that is mapped to the world. Okay. So this image is giving light to my scene, and if I turn off my plain light, this is what the mug looks like when it's lit just by the world. Okay, so I gave it a strength of two. Um, and what this mapping and texture coordinate nodes are doing is it allows me to actually rotate the image. So if we look at this mug right here, you can see there's a little bit of a highlight on the right side, and that's because this part of the image is a lot brighter than everything else. But with this mapping node set up, I can actually rotate it around the z-axis and change where that image is. Okay, so that's why that is there. Um, I also I unchecked uh, camera visibility so that it doesn't render, but it still gives the light onto the scene. And I'll turn my key light plane back on. And hit zero to go back into my uh, camera's view. So that's how that's set up, uh, and then uh, fit shift Z again and select my plane. Uh, you know, that's it's just a regular plane that I scaled up about three times and uh, set the material to an emission type. Gave it a slightly warmer color. Actually, no, I didn't. I meant to. There's a slightly warmer color there. Um, and again, if I hit shift Z in 3D view you can see the light that it gives off. Uh, and that's that's all I did to set this up. Uh, let's look at the mug real quick. I'm going to hit number pad slash to go into local view, and tab to go into edit mode, and 5 to go into orthographic. Uh, and this is what it is. If I select the handle, the handle is actually separate. Um, and then the rest of the mug is all one piece. It's just created with a cylinder that I continued to extrude and uh, add loop cuts to. It's got a subsurface modifier at level 2. It will render at level 3. Uh, and that's it. That's all there is to this model. So now let's start thinking about the texturing. 
And first I'm going to bring up my reference image, which is this. So we're going to do two textures on this, or, or two materials. It's going to be this black plastic material, and then there's going to be this brushed metal uh, material. Um, so the first thing that I want to do, I, can I move the wrong window over? Move that over. OK. The first thing that I want to do is, um, well, think about how I'm going to approach this. It's all set as one object. Uh, and I am actually going to keep it that way. That way, if I ever want to move it around, I just have to select one thing and I don't have to worry about groups. Just all one object. Um, but I can give one object multiple materials. Uh, and the way that I'm going to do that is click New. Got my first material. I will call this uh, plastic. Actually, I'm going to call it mug underscore plastic. Just if I ever add anything else to this scene, uh, it will help delineate materials between objects. So mug underscore plastic. And then I'm going to click this plus. Adds a new material slot. Click new. I'm going to call this one mug underscore metal. So I've got my two materials set up. Uh, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to select my mug plastic. I'm going to change the color to something a little bit darker. And in my settings, I'm going to change the viewport color. I want to change it to the same color that I set the surface to. Uh, and I could just try to get close by clicking on it and, and moving this down. Um, but an easier way is if I hover my mouse over the color and hit Command C, and then hover it over the viewport color and hit Command V, I can paste that uh, into the viewport color. So I can copy and paste uh, colors just like I would any other number. Uh, but you can see that that texture was applied, or that material was applied to the entire mug. And I want part of the mug to be metal. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tab into edit mode, and I want to select uh, the part of the mug that is going going to be metal. And if I look at this, let me just, uh, yeah, I can, if I select option right click, select this edge loop, shift option right click and select this edge loop, uh, I can grow my selection by hitting control plus. Uh, I will do this three times, let me go into wireframe, no, one more, four times. Okay, so I've got it selected all the way to this inside lower corner on this detail loop. Uh, and the way this cu cup was constructed is it's actually pretty symmetrical top to bottom. Um, so it selects the inside one there as well. All right, so once you have your mug selected, or, or the parts of the mug selected that you want to be metal, uh, over here, in your materials option, you can see that there's three buttons here, assign, select, and deselect. So we select the part we want to be metal, we select the metal material, and then we click assign. And then it will look like this. OK, so now I have the uh, two materials assigned to the vertices that I want to be the respective materials. This is great. Uh, as a side bonus to this, I, you've got these other two buttons, select and deselect. So if I want to only select the plastic parts, I can choose the plastic material and click select, and it only selects that. Same thing with the metal. Uh, it will add selection, so if you want to then deselect the plastic, select it again and click deselect. Um, very handy as you start getting more complex scenes. OK, so I've got the materials assigned. Now I need to actually figure out what the materials are going to be. Now, the plastic material I'm going to do procedurally, uh, which means it's only going to be done with generated uh, textures and the shaders. I don't have to UV unwrap it. The metal part I will UV unwrap because I'm going to want to apply a, an image or a graphic to it. So let's start with the plastic. Uh, and before I actually even, even get to this cup, I'm going to jump over, going to go into object mode and go to layer two, uh, maybe. Oh, I'm in local view. Number pad slash to go back to global view. And now I'm going to go to layer two and select my cube. And I'm going to give it a new material, and I'm just going to call it cube. Okay. 
Uh, now I'm going to go to, in my node view, I'm going to select the box here, which is going to change to my material nodes. And now I can see my material nodes for my cube. OK, so procedural textures, kind of what are they? Uh, um, they are kind of internally developed and applied textures based off of various algorithms you don't have to apply uh, a image texture to. So I've got my shader right here. Uh, for now, it's a, a diffuse shader. And I've got my three inputs, color, roughness, and normal. If I hit Shift A and, and go down to my texture, I've got all these different texture options. And I talked about this briefly last week, but I want to go into a little bit more depth uh, this time so we can start to figure out kind of what the power of these textures are. Um, one of the most common ones is noise. And if I connect the color to the color and then change my viewport shading to rendered, you can see what happens. That is something. Uh, by default, your noise texture is colorful. You can modify this. If I hit Shift A and add in a converter node, uh, I can choose either a color ramp or RGB to black and white. First, I'll choose RGB to black and white. And I'm just going to hover over this noodle until it turns orange and click. And it automatically inserts it. And now it's a black and white texture. It's colored tan because that's the color of the light and the light that's hitting it. Um, and actually, real quick, I'm going to jump over to layer one. I'm going to select my ground plane. And then I'm going to hit M. And I'm going to hold down Shift and select the second layer as well. So the ground plane is now on both layers. Now I'll go back to layer two and go back to rendered view. Uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm also going to go back to the first layer and I'm going to select my uh, light, my, my light plane. And I'm going to do the same thing with that. I'm going to hit M, hold down Shift, and select the second layer. So that's on both layers now as well. Then I'll go back to the second layer uh, and select my cube and hit Shift Z to go back into rendered view. And here we are. Okay, so we have our clouds or our noise texture applied to our cube. Um, and it's just automatically generating the, uh, the texture around the cube. I don't have to UV unwrap it. I don't have to tell it how to put it on the cube. It just automatically does it, and it looks pretty good. So I've looked at my noise texture, and I've got a few different options. I've got scale. If I make it smaller, the clouds kind of become bigger. I call this a cloud texture because in Blender, they used to have a separate noise texture and a cloud texture. Now it's all one. Um, let me, I'll zoom in here so you guys can see it at the back of the room a little bit better. Okay, so I've got, I've got a scale. I can go negative. Um, I don't really ever have a use to go negative, but smaller the number, the larger the, the clouds, the larger the number, the smaller the clouds. And if you go too large, it can be hard to see. Um, You'll also notice that in my render settings, I have my sampling set to 100 for preview and 1,000 for render. Okay, So I've got my noise texture. I can change the size with scale. Uh, I'm going to set it to, I don't know, maybe 10. 10 is good. You've got your detail settings. So that's how, how defined are these clouds. If I bring it up. You're going to get a little bit more detail, a little bit more variation in the clouds. Um, and then there's distortion, which will logically enough distort the clouds. If you crank that up a little bit, it, uh, it almost looks like a Van Gogh, kind of. I'm sure Van Gogh would be insulted to hear me say that, but it gets a little bit more swirly. Um, I'm just going to leave that, though, at zero. So if I just want this kind of black and white cloud texture. This is how I could do it. Where is this useful? This is useful if you need to add a little bit of variation and nuance to your textures. Um, if you want to add you know, maybe a little bit of dirt or grime um, in kind of a little bit more ambiguous sort of way, um, this is a way to do that. You could actually map this. Instead of mapping this to the color, 
you could map this to the displacement and then this would actually uh, serve as kind of a bump map uh, which you can't see too well here because we're using a diffuse texture but if I delete that and add in a glossy shader instead connect that to the surface now you can see how this noise texture works if I plug into the displacement as a bump map right? and again I didn't have to UV unwrap to get this distortion and it's still just a cube it's still just eight vertices but I get all this cool detail. So I hope you can start to see kind of how powerful this can become. Um, if I hit Shift Z and go into edit mode on this cube, I'm going to delete the vertices and I'm going to add in a UV sphere instead and move it up along the Z axis one unit. The reason why I did this in edit mode instead of object mode is because I wanted the materials to still be applied to this object. Um, but now it's just going to get a little bit confusing because the material is called cube and the object is called cube, but it is in fact a sphere. Uh, but on this sphere, I'm going to add a subsurface modifier. Now here's a little shortcut. If you're going to, if you want to add, excuse me, if you want to add a subsurface modifier at level two, hit control two and two, that's on, that's two on the keyboard, not on the number pad, um, control two and then automatically adds your subsurf modifier at level two. And then check optimal display. And I'm also going to hit T to bring up my toolbar and set my shading to smooth over here on the side. Then I can hit T again and hide that. And I'll go back into rendered view. Okay, and you can see that my glossy bumpy material is still applied to this. And I'm going to up the roughness on my glossy shader a little bit. I don't want the reflections to be too distracting. Okay. So that's the, my noise texture and that's if I want uh, black and white. I'm going to delete this glossy texture and I'm going to go back to a diffuse texture uh, or shader, I'm sorry, diffuse shader. Reconnect the BDSF to the surface and instead of displacement, I'm going to go into color. Okay, now I've got a cloud texture on my sphere. If I delete this RGB to black and white by just selecting it with left click and hitting X, I'm going to reconnect the color of my texture to the color of my diffuse shader, and I'm back to this kind of tie-dye colored cloud. Uh, now I'm going to hit Shift A, whoops, up here, hit Shift A, add in a converter, and now let's look at color ramp. So before we were looking at uh, RGB to black and white to turn it to grayscale. If I put the color ramp in, uh, it again, it goes to black and white, but that's because my scale here, my slider, is black and white. So I've got two lines here. They can be kind of tough to see, but I can left click, cl left -click to select them. And if I select the left one, I can change it from pure black to maybe blue and the right one I can change from white to maybe uh, I don't know maybe green okay and then I've got this drop down which is the interpolation drop down I can do constant B spline linear cardinal or ease so if I move the blue one in a little bit and I move the green one in a little bit let's start changing these options and see what happens so this is linear. It will be, you get the blue constant up until the slider, and then it will gradually uh, change to the green, and then from the second, from the green line over, it'll be constantly green. We've got uh, constant, which will be a constant color until one of these lines says otherwise. We have B spline, which kind of centers it around the two lines, or, or at least around the first line. I don't know the exact math that goes into these interpolations, but there is this pretty graphical representation, so I don't have to know the math. I can just look at it and figure out what I want. Uh, there's cardinal, which is slightly different, and I don't know how, and there's ease. Uh, all variations on a theme. So that's how I can adjust the colors. Uh, I can also, there's these two buttons up here, add and delete. So I can add a line. And I can make this line, 
I don't know, yellow if I want and make this a bit more hideous. Um, but I can do it. And I can make these more blue and I can make this more green. And maybe I want to change my blue one to red, just because. Maybe make it a little bit brighter. I can do that. Um, and actually, if I change this yellow one to a little bit more orange and change this green one to a little bit more yellow, now it looks a little bit more like the sun. And I could add an emission material to this. You know, if I deleted the diffuse material and shift A, add shader emission, then reconnect the color to the color and the emission to the surface. Now we've got a sun. Fun. Okay, so here's our kind of procedural sun texture, we'll call it. We can further alter this noise texture. And we're going to do that the same way that uh, I showed earlier with manipulating the environment texture. I'm going to add two more nodes. Shift A, add this time a vector and a mapping node. And then I'm also going to let me move over here a little bit. Shift A, add input and texture coordinate. Okay. So I'm going to, uh, first I'm going to connect my mapping vector to the noise texture vector, blue to blue. And it kind of gets, gets rid of my texture, which I obviously don't want. So now I need to actually tell it how to use these, this mapping information. So before I can input my location or rotation or scale data, I need to tell it how it, it's going to project that. Uh, and the way that I'm going to do that is through generated. So I'm going to drag, drag generated over to the lower vector here. And now my material is back. Okay, So now I'm back to where I started. And I can start using this mapping node. All right, so let's look at these options. I've got location options. I've got rotation options. And I have scale options. I also have minimum and maximum, uh, let's see, are they uh, clipping values. Um, so you can do clipping much like you can in Photoshop with um, levels. And those of you who are proficient in Photoshop will probably be even more familiar with that. Uh, than I am as I use Photoshop as a tool for other things and not exclusively as Photoshop. Um, but you've got those values. Um, but what I want to focus on right here for now is the, these scale options. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over to texture and I'm going to adjust my X scale. And we can kind of see it starting to warp. And I can, if I bring that back to one, I can adjust my Z scale. You can see it's starting to warp in that direction. Okay. Um, so, yes, uh, all of these values can be animated. Um, and you know, when we get to animation later in the semester, I'll cover that. Uh, but generally, the, the, the way to do that is you hover over the value you want to animate, and you hit I to insert a keyframe. It will turn yellow to tell you there's a keyframe on that frame. Okay. so. Now we can see how to manipulate these, uh, these procedural textures, again, without having to worry about UVs and unwrapping. Um, I can rotate it around the z-axis, and you can kind of see what it's doing, uh, although it's not behaving quite as expected. I wonder if I go to vector, if that. I don't know exactly the difference between these four options in the mapping node. Um, However, I do know that if you go to uh, the Blender wiki, uh, you can find the answer. If you go to Learn Reference, and let's see, let's try Node Controls, maybe? Let's see, let's, let's expand. Blender 2.6 user manual. And 
rendering with cycles, reference, nodes, and vector. Oh, currently no text in this page, so I guess they don't have the uh, documentation uh, fully committed yet. So I can't tell you. Play around with it, you'll eventually get a sense of what it does uh, and how to use it. But we'll stick with point uh, for now, or actually texture or vector. They all seem to work pretty well. Um, play around with it to get the results that you want. Again, there's no hard and fast rule for how you need to do something, so there's a, a healthy dose of experimentation uh, involved in this. Uh, so that's the noise texture. You can also um, add things and combine them together. So if I hit Shift A and go to Color, Mix RGB, I'm going to add that between the color ramp and the emission. So right now it is mixing uh, this, you know, the previous sun texture we had with this gray. Uh, and I can adjust that to you know, any other color that I want. You know, if I want to give it overall a more red cast, I can do that. Uh, I've got a factor value here, which all the way to zero will be the top input. All the way to one will be the bottom input. And 0.5 is halfway in between. I can change how it mixes them. So I can do add. So it will add this red uh, to everything and increase the intensity. Um, I can do an overlay. Again, these are blending modes. Uh, actually, that looks even more like a sun. Uh, these are blending modes the same way that you use them in Photoshop or After Effects or any other software that uses Blender nodes. They all use the same math to, uh, to work. So I can, I can combine colors. Um, I could, you know, this is just a little bit of experimenting because I don't know exactly how this is going to turn out, but I can now add another texture. And let's say I want to add a wave texture. And I want to plug the wave texture into the second color slot. Now I've got some waves that overlay it. And maybe I want to change this to rings and change the scale a little bit, maybe a little bit of distortion, increase the detail. OK. Uh, and if I want to just mix these, that's what mix looks like. I can multiply them together. I could just mix them and then, or actually, let's try this. Let's, instead of plugging this wave texture into the second color slot, let's plug it into the factor. See what happens. Now, I've got this wave texture deciding which parts of my sphere are the sun texture and which parts of the sphere are just red. Okay, uh, and I don't. I can change again the, the blending modes. Um, and the way that that this works, and the way that it's interpreting the wave texture, is black is a factor of zero, and white is a factor of one. So any value there in between will give me that corresponding value. OK, so if I, on my wave texture, if I add a converter color ramp to it and drag the black slider all the way over, then what I'm doing is I'm, I'm setting most of the factor to 0, because all of this is going to be 0. So it, it's going to be mostly the other texture. If I drag the black all the way to the left and then the white over, it's going to lean more towards the red. So I've got more control over it that way. I also have, um, if, I, if I click on this black swatch, you see I've got four sliders here. This last one, A, stands for alpha. So your alpha value, your transparency. I can adjust that as well, um, and it will affect the, uh, the image accordingly. So there's kind of infinite options and combinations here. Uh, and this is just, you know, I'm using the same three or four nodes, textures, color ramps, and a, a color mix node. Um, I can also, you know, I've got just one shader. It's just an emission right now. If I wanted to, I could hit Shift A and add in a glossy shader. 
and then Shift A, add in a shader, mix shader. And now I've got, if I combine them together, now it's glossy and it's emitting light. And I can adjust the factor, you know, and I could also grab my wave texture down here. Oh, actually, let's, just out of curiosity real quick, I'm going to plug the alpha into the factor instead. No, I'll go back. Okay. Uh, I can grab my wave texture, and I'll, I'll grab the output from that color ramp and put that into the factor of my mix shader. And now, it's kind of weird. Um, what I have is the wave texture is not only determining what is the sun, sun colors and what is just red, it's also determining what is emitting light and what is glossy. Uh, and right now my glossy shader is just kind of silver. So if I grab my color ramp from the sun and drag that over into the color input of my glossy shader, now my glossy shader also has the sun um, values. Uh, and as you can see, you know, very quickly you can get a seemingly pretty complex node tree. So I encourage you to work neatly, you know, drag things around, reorganize them uh, so that you can tell what is going to what. I'm actually going to delete this glossy shader and the mix shader because I don't want them. I'm going to reconnect my emission to my material surface output. Okay. Um, so that's, that's a little bit more on procedural textures. There's plenty of tutorials out there for using procedural textures to create uh, metallic objects, um, you know, plastics and glass and you know, all sorts of different things. Um, and again, these principles also apply to image textures. You just have to also UV unwrap um, your objects. Okay. All right, so let's press on a little bit. I'm going to hit Shift Z, go back into regular shaded view, and one on the keypad or on the keyboard to go to layer one. And let's return to our mug. Got my mug selected. Uh, and go over to my materials. I've got my two materials here. And if you notice in the node view, as I select them, the nodes will update. Um, the plastic, if I go in, back into shaded view, my plastic part is going to be just a procedural texture, and it's actually going to be a really simple one. Okay, it's, I'm going to hit Shift A and add in a glossy shader and shift A and add in a mix shader, shader, mix shader. And I'm just going to plug these into their corresponding spots. I'm going to copy the color from my diffuse and put it on my glossy. Actually, I'm going to make it a little bit lighter, maybe. And I'm going to set the roughness of my glossy down a little bit. Well, maybe not. And I'll set my factor down a little bit lower. And I'm actually going to make my diffuse a little bit darker. I don't want to go all the way black because nothing in real life is completely black. Uh, I'll make the glossy a little bit darker too. Okay. That was a very simple black plastic material uh, for my mug. Uh, now let's go and select our metal material and start thinking about this. So, as I look at my reference image, which is somewhere, here it is, uh, it looks to me like the metal section is kind of the brushed stainless steel texture that you see in a lot of things, cooking pots, um, obviously mugs, um, electronics have that brushed aluminum look. And it, it, this feels very similar. And the type of kind of surface on these is what's called an anisotropic uh, shader. Uh, and what anisotropic refers to is that the is the direction of the specular highlights. So you can see on this mug, the specular highlights are vertical. And the way that we uh, achieve that is by giving this metal an anisotropic shader. So in the nodes for the metal material, I'm going to delete the diffuse 
uh, shader and hit Shift A, add shader anisotropic. And I will connect the BDSF to the surface. All right, so I add my anisotropic shader and I'm already I'm actually pretty close to that looking like stainless steel. Um, uh, you know, at some point I might want to add some high frequency kind of bump map detail to get the, to make it look like it's got the brush strokes. But you can see that the um, specular highlights here are more distorted and more stretched vertically. This is a good thing. Um, I've got my anisotropy slider here, and if I move that all the way to one, you've got a, a much more kind of harsh, sharp effect. And if I move it all the way to negative one, it actually goes horizontal. Uh, at zero, there's nothing. It's just a regular glossy shader at zero. Um, so I'm going to move it up to um, actually I kind of like 0.5. Uh, we also have this rotation value so actually if I go up to 1 again real quick and adjust the rotation value uh, actually there we go it's uh, between 0 and 1 but you can adjust the rotation on it uh, as well but I'm going to keep that at 0 and then anisotropy at 0.5 and then you've got a roughness value so at 0 um, you've got completely clear reflection and at 1 um, barely any visible reflection but I'm gonna bring that back down to 0.2 okay and then of course you can adjust the color as you can with anything else so I'm, I'm happy with that as a shader. Um, now let's start thinking about uh, texturing and adding a image texture or a graphic to this mug. Uh, and for that, before we worry about this mug, I'm going to uh, hit Shift Z and go back to layer two. I'm gonna select this ball and I'm gonna, going to, actually, you know what, I'm just gonna go to layer three and hit Shift-A and add in a cube. Okay, I've got my cube. I'm going to tab to go into edit mode, and I want to unwrap this cube. And so the way that I'm going to do that is on the top here, I'm going to go into edge select mode, and I'm going to select these three edges that make a U, and I'm going to hit Control-E, mark seam. Uh, and then I'm going to select these two edges on this side and these two edges on this side and again hit control E mark seam so on the on the top I've got a U or I guess from this perspective it's an N uh, and then on the sides I've got the same thing kind of a backward C on the side and a C on the side okay so my front face if I go hit one to go in front view, the front face, none of the seams are selected. Um, and then from the back side, the bottom seam is not marked. Um, everything else is marked as a seam. So I've got my seam set. I'm going to split my bottom view. And on the side here, I'm going to change it into my UV image editor. I'm going to hit X to clear out the render result. And then I'm going to double tap A uh, in my 3D view to select the whole box and hit U and unwrap. And this is what I get. Okay. Next thing that I'm going to do is, uh, let me see, can I do this without adding an image? I'm going to click UVs, export UV layout. Okay, so, uh, it's, hold on a second, okay. Uh, UVs, export UV layout. And then I've got these options down in the bottom left. Format PNG and size. Uh, I'm actually gonna go full 4K, 4096 by 4096. And then I'm going to name this. Um, whoops. Coffee mug underscore UVs, and I'm going to save it 
the In My Textures folder. Uh, let's see, underscore UVs. And I'm just going to add demo because this is the one that I am doing uh, that's being recorded. Export UV layout. And oh, actually, before I do that, coffee mug underscore cube because this isn't actually the mug. Okay. So I've saved my exported UV layout. Now I'm going to come into Photoshop and ignore that. But I'm going to open up my cube. And this is what I get. You can't really see what's going on there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in a solid color. And uh, I'm going to choose white. And I'm going to move that layer below my UV layer. And I can see it, but you probably still can't see it on the projector or on the recording. So let's change my solid color to black and see if that does better. Yeah, that's better. OK. So what this UV exporting has done is given me kind of a template that I can now come into Photoshop and kind of draw, paint, um, add photos, whatever I want to do to give this a texture. Okay. So on, at its very basic, most simple forms, I can come into Photoshop, add a new layer, and if I want to call this layer, uh, we'll call it color. I can take my brush and we'll make it maybe blue. And let's put an X here. And we'll put a kind of a sideways T here because that's the top. And then maybe a circle here. And a couple lines there. And maybe a triangle here. Wonderful. Now, to bring this back into uh, Blender, now that I've drawn this fabulous texture. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off uh, this black background. Unless I want, the, want it to be bad, want the texture to be black, then I can leave it on. Uh, but I definitely want to make sure I turn off my UV layer, which again I should name this uh, UVs, so I know which one is that. But I definitely want to turn that off before I export it. So I'll turn that off, and then I will do uh, file. Save for web. It's PNG. I'm going to leave transparency enabled. Um, save. And I'm going to save this as coffee mug cube demo underscore. Some people save it as color. I'm going to save it as dot diff for diffuse. Um, just means color. Save it in my textures folder. Click save. Okay. Now I'm going to jump back to Blender. And I'm going to, in my UV image editor, Actually, I don't have to do it in there. Uh, but I've got my cube selected. I'm going to give it a new material. I'm going to hit Shift A, um, Texture, Image Texture, link the color to the color. Uh, let me go into Rendered View. Oh, I also need to uh, go back to layer one real quick. Select my floor and my light and add it to the layer 3. Go back to layer 3. I need to move this up one unit so that it's on the floor. Now I can go into Shaded View. OK, cool. So I'm in Shaded View. It's purple because I haven't given it its image texture. So now I need to open textures, cube demo diff, open image. And there is my wonderfully painted image applied to the cube. Okay, So that's how you can use UVs. Um, aside from manipulating the UVs and moving them around so that they're on, a, uh, on an image, you can also export your UV layout and then go into Photoshop and paint them or add an image to them, whatever you want to do. So now I'm going to go back. Um, to object mode and go to layer one and select my mug. And now I need to set my seams for my mug. And the way that I want to do this, I think I can get away with if I just come around to the back side, the side the camera is not going to see. And um, let's see, I want to only select, I only want to select the, the part that's metal here. 
So I'm going to option right click on this edge loop and you can see if I go to wireframe view it goes all the way through the whole thing. But if I come up here and select plastic and click deselect, it will deselect all the plastic bits uh, and then I just have to deselect this front side so I'm going to hit C to go to circle select and then middle click and drag to deselect those edges. Uh, and then now with just this edge selected I can hit control E and mark seam. And then I'm going to select my metal material, click select, and then U and unwrap. And you can see it gives me these UVs. Okay. So I've got this unwrapped. Uh, now what I'm going to do, um, I haven't unwrapped the plastic because again I don't need to, and it only unwraps what you have selected. So I'm going to hit shift space to maximize my view here. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate this and position it so that I can scale it and get it to its maximum size so I can get the most texture detail it, on it uh, possible. Okay. Uh, so we'll call it that and then just like we did with the cube, I'm going to go to UVs, export UV layout, go to my textures folder and name it coffee mug underscore UV and export the UV layout. Now I can jump over into Photoshop. Let's close that one. Don't save. Now I'm going to open coffee mug UV, open. And I've got my UVs there. I'm going to give it a solid color background, move it below my UVs, and there it is. Now I placed the seam on the back side of the mug, which means the center here is going to be the front side of the mug. That's where I want to add my graphic. So I'm going to hit File and Place, and uh, I have this already downloaded. I'm going to move it. Uh, let's see. Let's scale it down a little bit. Move it over here and rotate it. Say like that. Scale it down a little bit more move it there and hit enter to confirm move it above my UVs there's my logo and you know what I'm going to make that a touch smaller and then it's probably pretty close to straight hit enter then I'm going to turn off my back my background layer and my UVs and save for web. Uh, that's command option shift s it is the shortcut for those who aren't familiar. I'm going to set my image size to 4k and click save. I'm going to save it as coffee mug underscore diff. Save, replace, Then I'm going to jump back into Blender. And on my anisotropic BDSF, Shift A, add texture, image texture, connect the color to the color, and choose, oops, open textures, coffee mug underscore diff, open image, and go to shaded view, and nothing works. Uh, and that's because the whole color is being applied and I need to set the alpha. So what I need to do is actually add in a, uh, I believe, it is a color mix RGB. And I think I need to set that here. Actually, set the alpha into the factor. There we go. And it's upside down. So let me jump back into Photoshop. Oops, that's not what I want to do. Undo. Uh, select that and rotate it 180 degrees. Like that. Just double check my UV layout. Yep, that looks good. Resave that for the web. 4096, save. Coffee mug diff, save, replace. 
jump back into Blender. And I'm just going to reselect that. And now it's right side up. Now you'll notice that it is also inverted. And I believe if I set this to, what is it? Is it overlay? I can't remember which one it is. Ah, there it is. Set the image texture to color two. And now I've got an image applied to my coffee mug. So I go to my camera view, maximize it. And that is how you get an image onto an object with UV unwrapping.